Welcome to Secrets to Selling Your Business, the podcast for entrepreneurs and business owners looking to unlock the secrets behind successful business transitions. Join our host, Jacob Koenig, a partner at Woodbridge International, as he gives you the knowledge to navigate complexities, embrace strategic shifts, and prepare you to sell your business with no regrets. At Woodbridge, we know how to give you the wisdom to achieve your ultimate success. And now, here's your host, Jacob Koenig. Welcome to the show. I'm joined today by Bill Perone from Wigan and Dana. Bill and I actually know each other. We've been working together uh, for some time here, and so um, we're looking forward to having our, our normal kind of conversation and uh, and letting you in on a bit of, uh, of what goes on behind the scenes. So, Bill, welcome. Thank you. Thanks. Nice to see you, Jake. Yeah, you as well. All right. So, um, look, for the, the benefit of our, our audience, I'd like to get a little bit of, of background here to start off. So, um, maybe I'll ask this first question for you. How did you make your way from being an economist with the Bureau of Labor Statistics to where you are now? So, you know, it, I worked for the uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, which is a division of the Department of Labor, worked in the New York City office. These are the people that are famous for the CPI index. And uh, it was basically an expedient job for me. I'm a New York City native, and uh, I needed to bank myself a little bit to pay for law school. When I started working, I knew I was going to go to law school, but I needed to work for a couple of years before I embarked uh, on that journey. And what the the job involved was in, in a variety of industries, everything from structural steel to the garment industry to even law firms, was gathering uh, data, salary, compensation, and benefits data, which then kind of went into the combine and was, you know, the, the Bureau of Labor Statistics or BLS would churn out various data, you know, in, in various industries. And I just found it interesting. I was meeting, you know, I would sit with the the, the head of HR at, at, at Bechtel and, and, and places like that. So uh, it was a good insight. It was a good kind of preview into what ultimately would, would become my career, just meeting with business people in different industries and learning a little bit about, uh, about those industries, uh, which I think was a great stepping stone. And then you made your way into into law and, and business law in particular. Right. I, when I when I decided to become a lawyer, I knew, uh, first of all, I knew that the characterization of, of lawyers on, on TV was very far from, from accurate. It's not like everybody has this riveting question and killer question that's going to trip the witness up. And it was much more of, of a slog. And, and I think that uh, corporate lawyers, I, I think by, by nature or nurture are you know passive aggressive it is a way for for detail oriented people to uh, not have things be a, a, a one-way street so corporate law in particular m a is is not a win-lose situation and I think that litigation is is kind of like that right you go to war you fight somebody wins somebody loses but in the in business dealings you really try to get the best deal you can for your client given all the facts and circumstances given the leverage that you have or don't have in a deal and you try to do the best you can and and help clients achieve their their goals and and to me that was a uh, I was fascinated by that fascinated by meeting people People in, in different industries who right. looked at the world differently depending upon whether they were making widgets or they were developing software or providing some services in some particular industry. So it's uh, it's uh, it's stood me in good stead for for a number of years. Sure, and learning about those different industries pretty interesting as well. Yes. Absolutely. Excellent. So what were some of your early experiences then getting into the M&A world? Well, I, I started my career at a, at a, a tax boutique where there, you know, we got a lot of business deals because we um, provided a uh, much broader tax-based, uh, you know, expertise to, to business owners and we had a lot of international clients and cross-border things so we really what you know when you're an associate when you're, you're starting out you're you're basically doing um, you know what comes across your desk and it was a it was a smaller firm I, I did not like unlike a lot of my colleagues at, at, at Wigan and Dana I, I did not start at, at big law you know the mega firm so there was uh, more of an opportunity to kind of 
see things in other areas because the the attitude was kind of you're a lawyer you'll figure it out as opposed to staying in your lane you know you you are an ERISA lawyer you will only do ERISA things and you know in some ways it was it was a great broad based experience and in some ways frankly I'm glad the the statute of limitations has run because sometimes I think back of a few of the things that I might have done where the, you know dabbling could be could be a little dangerous but I had I had some good mentors and good teachers and it was really a like a, just a mixed bag of of, of deals of, of different kind of transactional work uh, that again was very satisfying and has been very satisfying professionally because again learning about new businesses learning about how how to deal with people right and and, and people in particular industries I think attract certain kind of people who you know rough and tumble in one industry and and others are more like a like a think tank you know more cerebral things that then uh you know banging out widgets or something like that and then uh fast forwarding now to to where you are and, and all the experiences that you've had I'm, I'm curious to hear a bit from you what what are the keys to handling complex uh, m a transactions I think the successful lawyers who do a lot of M and A are are good and and very facile at kind of breaking down uh, deals into their various elements. And I think that regardless of the industry, there are you know a set of of commonalities across businesses, regardless of what the the business is. And I've always believed that uh, being industry agnostic as i like to describe our group will stand you in good stead because if you are focused on the you know the, let's say just just do defense industry or just say you do healthcare transactions you know they, they, every business has this uh, cyclical nature to it and it's in favor it's hot it's not hot if you you spread yourself and can do lots of things uh, again with a good team to, to to support you you will basically make yourself recession proof so you'll be be able to do deals when 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 a deal in one area has gotten really cold i mean i'll, I'll give you a quick example um, people who were expert in mortgage-backed securities and that whole aspect of financing, which was, was huge, right? Multi-billion dollar global business. But when the Great Recession hit, these folks, because I, I interviewed a lot of them, these folks were at, at major firms were shown the door. This is like basically... You know, you're too senior to re-engineer yourself. We don't want you to re-engineer yourself. We want to do the next new thing, the new shiny object, and therefore you've got to go find something else. So yeah. I, I think that um, the, the, the key is to you know, break it down. The, the commonalities are things like you know, everybody has employees, so you're going to have right. employee issues and, and benefits issues. There's going to be a tax aspect to, to most deals. I think it's important to get your head around what the, the client's business, the, the pricing model is mm -hmm. uh, what one of the components of the EBITDA what are the margins on various things what are the what are the trends in in their industry is it um for example during the uh, during the pandemic we noticed an uptick in business to consumer and consumer products especially home goods and things like that because people were sitting around their house or in their apartment or locked down they look around oh i think i need a new rug i think i need a new lamp and, and now i think those businesses got what commonly referred to as a COVID bump i think that things have calmed down and that you know there's always going to be that but uh, the, the the pandemic was a, a game changer in terms of being a real uh, plus for certain businesses yeah and then a killer for others right killer for hospitality so you're in hotel or restaurant and that's so good yeah. Or, or, or ancillary businesses that touch those industries. That was a long, cold, lonely winter period. And certainly, being industry agnostic, that uh, that strikes home for us at Woodbridge as well. We we are the same way. So absolutely understood on that. And yes. Look, this is the the secrets to selling your business podcast. So I have to ask from the the lens of a uh, a business owner who's looking to sell. You know, how do you think about advising those uh, entrepreneurs and and otherwise who are um, selling their businesses in in an M and A transaction? Well. It's a great question. I think that it's it's tricky sometimes, and what what we've seen 
happen in, in a few instances is that when you, whether you built your business from scratch or whether you're second generation or third generation, or you acquired a business and then you've scaled it up and now you're in a point where, where you want to exit, I found that uh, there's really a continuum of of the way in which business owners operate their their business. And by that, I mean, some are very buttoned down. So, for example, if you know, if you left a giant company, a global company where you had some you know, middle market, uh, I'm sorry, or mid-level position, and then you, you bank enough money to, to support yourself to buy a, buy a company and, and start, you know, build your own mousetrap. Folks like that tend to come with a little bit more discipline, a little bit more organization. The, the regular or, you know, kind of seat of the pants entrepreneur, which which I've always had, uh, you know, soft spot in my heart and maybe my head head for. <laughs> what what happens is when they go to market, so they've kind of run this thing as their fiefdom and and their own kind of little, you know, it's a pejorative term, but you know, kind of candy store where, you know, it was you know maybe it wasn't like buy the book on my personal expenses or wasn't buy the book on, on on my accounting habits and things like that. When they bump a, up to buyers who are professional buyers, sophisticated buyers, which are you know, pretty much every time is the type of buyer that, that Woodbridge uh, produces. These are folks, they want stuff, they want to tie it up with a bow, they want it buttoned down nice and neat, and they get a little crazy when they see like, oh, they, they didn't do this, and they didn't account for this properly. Mm-hmm. And, and sometimes we've had to pull back, clean up our act, so to speak. Uh, you know, it's easy for me to say after the fact that you should always, you know, build your business to sell and always think, even if you're going to be at it for 20, 25 years, that you should be ready to sell tomorrow and that everything should be nice and, and, and neat and tied up with a bow. Uh, the reality is that that's not, not what happens. And I think that it's, it's a bit of a rude awakening for some entrepreneurs because no one's questioned what they did before. Nobody's, at, you know, it's just like yeah. everything's been going fine. I'm taking out all this, you know, I'm making all this money. I'm growing. I'm employing, uh, you know, 200 people, 100 people. And now you don't like this, you don't like that. And they, there's an element of frustration. And, and you know, we can, we can talk clients off the ledge and kind of get them back down and, and remind them of why they embarked on the journey, why they embarked on the sell side journey. Any number of reasons they want out. They're tired. It's time. Their kids aren't interested. They, right. they don't have kids, whatever. Uh, and there's no, a lot of times, oh, I want to sell to my management. That's, it's a common refrain. You know the problem? Management doesn't have any money. Management very often doesn't have any money. And I, I've yeah. told clients to not sell, you know, here's the whole business, sell it to, you know, Charlie and the team. They're awesome. But I'm they're going to take back a note for the whole amount. Well, good. You just put your future at risk of them running the business, not defaulting, yeah. not like giving you back your, you know, your broken your broken toy uh, because they couldn't and, uh, make it work, yeah. right? It's a tricky business. Yeah. Have that preparation going into things and then to be able to remind the clients what it is that, that got them motivated to, to reach out to a, an M&A broker in the first place. Exactly. Right. And, and I also yeah. urge people, and I would urge people, there's pretty rare instances where, where I would, would not use a, an intermediary. I learned early on in my career when I had a client, he was a very successful guy you know he's the ceo of a new york stock exchange company who then started another company very successful and he was convinced he knew the industry he knew the players he knew everybody right and then guess what he hired a banker and the banker got like a buyer a foreign buyer that wasn't on the radar uh, for two x what this guy was was you know, every every buy, every show has i've got my number you know, i got my number right. in my head uh, well, this was like 2x of the number and I learned this many years ago and yeah. I said to myself you need to, you need to get an intermediary you need someone to create an auction for you and to generate interest and to pit one buyer up uh, against the other to get you you only get to sell your business once so yeah. so being able to to get the right people around you and having that absolutely. right advice that's that's definitely a key absolutely having the having the right team is is uh, is critical and then once you have a uh, a situation where you're you've got the LOI sign and you're you're moving along having that preparation ahead of time definitely helps to to speed things up and and keep the process moving along i'd like to hear a bit more uh, you know from your perspective how do you how do you work to make sure that the process stays on track and, and to the timeline? I think that, well, you know, I know in, in, in working with, with Woodbridge, I mean, one of the things, the uh, you know, they're 
mantra which I, I have definitely uh, adopted and that is that time kills deals and uh, I'm in uh, I'm in the middle of a situation now with a different banker that uh, frankly I've never I've never seen such a, a lack of a sense of urgency I think they think I'm crazy because I'm where is this why are we not doing this why is this taking so long why why is it taking a month to turn an LOI I mean for for, you know, for crying out loud it's, this is not it's hard but it's not rocket science and you know it's not brain surgery so you you, you know you get the best deal you can I, I think that uh, a, a lot of of what happens is is just managing expectations keeping people informed of where things stand reminding you see we always tell folks and i know the woodbridge does it at the boot camp you're essentially working two jobs so you you've got to keep the, the business train on the tracks you've got to keep the ebitda trends where they're going always you know always up and then and, and you're not down if you can help it and then your your night job you're moonlighting answering uh, you know a million questions from a half a dozen people it's responding to due diligence requests explaining this digging out organizing your contracts and producing things for the virtual data room or the vdr and you know, keeping the sale process uh, on a need-to-know basis i i am not a proponent of of having broad group of people know that you're on the market i think you need to have a tight group of dependable people on your team who have a need to know and they have and they're discreet uh, and sometimes you need to reward them for that discretion which is which is fine because yeah. I'd, i've really seen an entrepreneur or an owner be able to do this on their own i think that that is that's a problematic it's just only so many not so many hours of the day the business is hard enough to run and now you're doing all this other stuff and right hires lawyers are asking your main questions the buyers accountants are asking your main questions right. the quality of earnings mm -hmm. uh, analysis that the, the buyer's going to have their accounting firm do you're, you're answering you, you've been the boss you answer to yourself yeah. and now you've got 20 people telling you what to do yeah exactly to get the right help around you once again i think that's yeah. uh, that's a main a main factor and yeah we we do say time kills all deals you know even when the business is running well and everything is going smooth there's always external factors things that are completely outside of anyone's control there could be a pandemic you know there could be a uh, a bank run um as we saw in the spring so you know that actually that brings up my my next question which is how have you seen you know the rising interest rates bank runs in the spring having impacted uh, the m a environment it's, it's definitely having a, a, an impact uh, jake it's not fortunately it, it's not having uh, the profound impact that and i, and I think that the recession uh, i think technically we we've had one we may be in one but i i'm always i'm a glass half full person so i'm thinking that this is pretty it's pretty shallow i mean the government is uh, inflation is still high the government has stopped printing money which was uh, which cured a lot of ills when when that money was just flying out of washington you know, we'll, we'll pay that that right. price ultimately what i think you're seeing is um a lot more seller financing seller notes where the the bank uh, if you I, look if it's in an ideal world you get a buyer with a with a fat bank roll who's just like i don't need we don't need anybody's money we have the money on hand that's a dream world that doesn't happen often it happens on, on occasion right. so they will fund the purchase with a combination a little cocktail of, of debt and equity and we're seeing more of that debt seller some people call them buyer notes some people call it seller notes but essentially it's the seller is taking back some of the financing and if your buyer is also going to a lender an institutional type lender for uh to fund the transaction your seller note is going to take a back seat you're going to sign what's called a subordination agreement which means that if the bank isn't getting paid you know you're not getting paid so there's an element of risk a financial risk there the trend too we're seeing uh and this is i'm talking about the middle market now we are seeing a lot more heavier rollover and and a rollover i think is is positive in in many many ways and in, in in, in, first and foremost it's almost a way to sell your company twice because you get a chunk of money at the closing and then you get the balance and, and we can structure it in a tax deferred manner you get the balance in equity of the buyer or the buyer's parent and uh, you know you typically you're not going to have a lot of bells and whistles attached to that equity you'll get some 
you get some rights, maybe preemptive rights, uh, financial statements, information rights, and, and, and things like that. But you are essentially riding the bus that the private equity firm or the buyer is driving. And, and ideally, you're, let's say you have a $20 million deal and you roll over $4 million. Ideally, in three, four, five, six, whatever years, yeah. that is that amount is doubled. Yeah. And especially, you know, for, for clients that we are representing where, where they come off of a pandemic bump, they're they're off from the highest highs that they've seen. They're they're looking at a maybe a lower number than they thought originally. Um, to have that equity role, that potential upside for the future, to find that right partner and grow together is, a, is appealing for a lot of people. Yeah. And I think, yeah, no, exactly. And I think one of the other things about it is that uh, unlike the, the next thing I want to mention, the the interest on, on the rollover, the appreciation of the rollover, the interest of the, it's a rare opportunity when the interest of buyer and seller are aligned. Yeah. You got to remember, right. the buyer is buying this business to make yeah. money. They're not buying it because it's a charity and they like your face and they want to just give you money. So exactly. if, 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 if the value of your shares rise, the value of their interest rises. So everybody's everybody's happy. The, the other thing that we're seeing, and, and we're seeing an increase, the rollover, you know, you'd see maybe five to ten percent three, four years ago. We're seeing as much as forty uh, percent rollovers in some deals. And and the, the last prong, I think, would be earnouts. Earnouts have really gotten very popular in in recent years. And and what that is essentially is setting um, mutually agreed upon metrics, whether it's a gross profit or EBITDA or sometimes top line revenue. If you hit those targets, then you get more money. And and this is a hedge by buyers uh, of not paying too much because. Yeah. If you don't perform, you, you, you promise them that we're going to do great. We're on this upward uptick, right? This trend. And if they give you a bunch of cash at closing and you were wrong, they're on the short. They've got the short end of the stick. Yeah. This is a way for them to, you know, keep your feet to the fire. And if it's if it's true what you said and we're going to grow and the growth is this much, you make money and the buyer makes right. money. And so, you know, the higher cost of capital, we are definitely seeing this increase in, in structure, move away maybe from the, from being all cash at close. And would you say uh, you know, seller notes, as you as you mentioned, having having those locked in at a, at a pretty decent interest rate where we are right now, that's also uh, been appealing for a lot of uh, a lot of Upsell. Yes. And and again, the seller note is, is more often than not going to be subordinated. Even if it's secured, it's it's often not secured. Or if it is right. secured, the security interest takes a backseat to the bank's security interest. So it, it really is dependent on the success of, of the business. So there's an element of, of risk to it. If you feel good about your buyer and, and, and exactly. again, a lot of uh, most of the, um, if not all the, the buyers that, that Woodbridge produces are are well healed. They're experienced buyers who are players in the industry. They've done lots of deals. They they're going to do lots of deals. They have good financial partners behind them because they have good track records. and And I think that's something that you need to consider and take into the mix as you as you evaluate your buyers. And so, what have you seen as as other things that have created drags in the in the timeline or otherwise when when working through a transaction? I, I think that. Oftentimes, you know, two, two things uh, that come to mind, Jake, and, and one is when there is a financing, uh, a bank financing, institutional financing, yeah. you're not just dealing with the buyer's lawyers. You're then dealing, and, and it's always this indirect dance, right? You're always dealing with... Yeah. And then maybe buyers, lawyers lie and, and hide behind banks, lawyers. But we want this. What about this? What about that? So the the buyer is beholden to the uh, bank and, and indirectly or vicariously. So is the seller, because if the buyer can't get the money from the bank, then you're not going to have a sale. You're not going to have a deal. Right. And so it's it's not just appeasing the buyer's counsel. You've got to appease the bank counsel and you got to mm-hmm. just make everybody happy. That can that can slow things down. The other thing is if you're doing a deal that's, you know, and, and again, the ballpark value, if you're doing a deal on the 20, it's come down a little bit, but say, like, you know, 20, mid 20s million dollar range where there's got to be rep and warranty insurance, which is a whole topic for another day. You're then dealing with another law firm because the rep and warranty insurer will have somebody kick the tires. They do due diligence. And so you're responding to yet another set. It's like a lawyer fest where you're responding to another set of lawyers. And and that can be that can be a drag. And the, and the last one to kind of tie this 
point up is uh, you want to get ahead of required third party consents you know you want to push right. Right. push for that closing checklist push for what consents are needed i actually have seen people surprisingly happily uh, on the sell side back off of what they really really need if you press your your buyer especially with with supplier contracts right. your suppliers you, you, they don't want to lose the business right so they've been selling to to jake for, for 20 years and now bill's a new sheriff well well great you don't you're not going to buy my witches anymore no buy my witches you know they, they want you yeah. to, to stay a customer uh, when you're selling your uh you know some buyers can be persnickety right if if they they maybe had an experience with some affiliate of your buyer, then that can kind of bite you, you know, where you, where you don't want to be bitten and, and uh. surprise you. It doesn't, it's, it's an exception, though. Usually yeah. people fall in line. It's more the administrative burden of getting it because giant companies, they're not, I tell my team to get ahead of it because people are not waiting by the phone for Bill to call and say, hey, we're selling the business, we need your consent. Get in line, right? It's 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 not like they're waiting for you, right? And it's about looking around the corner to see what are the upcoming things that could trip up the deal, knowing what those are ahead of time, and and making yeah. sure that that you've uh, gotten things in motion such that it doesn't hold up the deal once you get there. Otherwise, exactly. And so when you are looking across the aisle and you're working with your your counterparty lawyers what are the things you you keep in mind as you uh, aim to optimize the the deal for your own clients i i am a, a big I, I tell when i pitch clients for work i say that if you want if you want a screamer or a table pounder then go someplace else i i think one of the reasons that that i and then the like team members chose this area is because it is it is collaborative. It's a little bit more. It's a little bit more bespoke, and and people mm-hmm. you should be you know measured with your words. I, I think that if and another reason to have an intermediary is that if you're going to introduce some new concept or some economic change to the deal. I, I'm a believer in. I don't want the first time that comes to light to be in a document that shows up and I say, what what is this? What do you mean I'm giving a a parent guarantee? I like those things to be socialized by the banker through the principles on the the other side so that Mm. you may not get... You may not get buy-in, but at least no one can say, where did this come from? No one likes surprises. Exactly. Surprises mean delays, so we like to avoid that. Yeah, and actually, we, we say sometimes uh, surprises and time. It's um, yeah. something we also definitely think about as, uh, as we go along in, in our transactions. And, and certainly, being able to have those conversations, frankly, directly, transparently. You know, I think that's really the key, and and having a, a lawyer on on a, a deal who understands that and, and works collaboratively, that's um, that's crucial to, to the success of the uh, of the transaction. Working towards yes. not just what's best for me, but what's what's middle of the road, what's uh, the the market way to do something. Yeah, I mean, and one of the things about working with a firm that then has. Uh, yeah, tons of experience on, on all kinds of deals in, in different sizes and different industries is knowing what's market and and I, I always think it's a good not just the empathy part of it I think it's good to, to kind of listen to yourself and and how would you receive if you're going to make some kind of a little bit out there far-flung request of somebody how would you react if someone said that to you you've got to put yourself in the other person's shoes and, and i think that will carry you a long way to getting your deal done done not getting anybody angry that not, not losing credibility right so if you are making if you're making kind of wacky non-market requests you're going to lose credibility and and what i tell people is if you have any of the many many popular things roll over earn out mm-hmm. sell or no where your relationship is very rare that your relationship today ends with the buyer at the closing table. It's not like when you sold your house, you drop the keys on the kitchen counter and, and see you and you go off into the sunset. If you're going to have a relationship that transcends and you know lasts beyond the closing, you don't, in the process of doing the deal, you don't want to come off as, gosh, you know, man, Bill is difficult to deal with. Are we going to deal with him for another two years? And you know he's going to work for us for another two years. You don't want to be that seller. Right. Building that trust, building those bonds, that's uh, that's another important critical, critical part of the con- the, the transaction. Critical. You know, and on, on the on the trust side, if you have something going on, if there's a 
environmental issue or there's a lawsuit, get ahead of it, get ahead of it in the in the confidential information memorandum because right. if, if the seller tumbles to it and you, I'm sorry, the buyer tumbles to it and you didn't tell them, they're going to be looking around corners, they're going to be seeing ghosts, they're going to say, what else What else did Bill not tell me about? What else could he be hiding? You you want to maintain that trust throughout the process. It's, it's, it's very, very critical. And so uh, maybe a, a, a transition slightly away from um, from the business discussion, but uh, I see the, the beautiful guitars there in the background. I'm, I'm curious to hear you know, how, how have your hobbies, you know, including playing guitar and, and bass, played into your work? Well, it, it's it's funny you ask. Thank you. Yeah, these are my these are a couple of a couple of my friends. I, I work to support my my habit. Um, actually, this one, that's a guitar that I've had. Uh, I I bought as a as a boy. It was my my first thing, you know good wow. guitar and so it's been around a long time it's seen a lot and mm. i you know it, it's just something that i actually wanted to do and and my parents wisely uh, convinced me to get a day job and i thank them i thank them every day it was it was good advice and it, it, it really it keeps me balanced i still play i i, I played you know when i you know, played more in, I was in the New York metro area. I, I was amazed at how I would get the CEOs and CFOs of public company clients to show up to show up at some gin mill, literally like, and they'd be like, I haven't been in, I'm in like a bar, like a music bar yeah. since I was in college. And I would get these people to show up and, and spend the night and yeah. they, I, they'd send me videos. And it was really, right. it was really kind of fun because I think down, down deep, uh, many people are, are rock and rollers and they, they, yeah. they, may, they may not be so overt about exactly. it. Exactly. But it's, it's good, and we're all uh, super, super excited seeing you play uh, out in, in Cape Town when we had our, our 30th anniversary. So we you know firsthand how how enjoyable it is. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, no, no, that was yeah. uh, that was that was that was special. That was great. Good, uh, yeah. great event. Yeah, it was great to uh, to have you come and, and play as well. So thank you. Excellent. Is is there anything else otherwise that uh, that we haven't touched on that you wanted to mention or? Um, yeah, I think anything, I, I think that. I think no. I think this is this was great. This was uh, I really enjoyed. Always enjoyed talking to you. I was you know these are great questions and important questions for for entrepreneurs and hopefully you know between us here that people can take away from this a few pearls of wisdom to think about as they yep. uh, embark on the on the journey to sell. I mean it, it's it's hard. It's also it's emotional for a lot of people, especially if this has been your you know your baby for decades or maybe it's been in your family. Your business has been in your family family for decades it is um once you make the decision I, i'm a big believer in in executing on plan and just just do it just go for it and and you're gonna it'd be tough tough for a bit and then when you get to the goal and get to the promised land it's a good it's a good feeling i, I still i keep in touch with a lot of my uh, my my sellers who've uh, sold their business and uh regale me with with fishing stories and and, and travel and stuff it's kind of neat well, on that note, um, thank you very much, Bill Perone from Wigan and Dana. We appreciate your time here today, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Jake. Take care. Right. You're well. Bye now. Thank you for listening to another episode of Secrets to Selling Your Business, the podcast for entrepreneurs and business owners looking to unlock the secrets behind successful business transitions. We hope you enjoyed listening to this week's guest and their insights. If you like what you heard, please consider subscribing wherever you listen to podcasts.